everyone. My name is Quan Fong. Thank you very much for the chance to participate in your wonderful annual congress. And it is my great honor to discuss lung cancer screening early detection of nodule diagnosis. We all know that lung cancer is the biggest cause of cancer deaths globally and it is curable at an early stage but most of the time it presents with advanced disease when survival is short and cure uncommon. There are established screening programs for breast, bowel and cervical cancer in many countries but only the US and Korea have approved national programs for lung cancer screening. I think we all know that there are two high quality randomized controlled trials which have now proven that CT screening with low dose CT reduces lung cancer mortality. These are the US National Lung Cancer Screening Trial, the NLST, with a 20% relative reduction in lung cancer mortality after three rounds of screening, and the Dutch Belgian Netherlands Leuven's Lung Cancer Screenings, i.e., Nelson study, which showed a 10 year lung cancer death rate ratio which was reduced with lung cancer screening. Here I show you the most recent published trial which is the UK lung screening trial, a randomized controlled trial comparing low dose CT with usual care. This was just published this year. It's a single low dose CT screening trial which is different from the others for people at high risk of developing lung cancer and this was assessed by the Liverpool Lung Project Risk Model, LLP version 2, to identify people who would have a greater than 4.5% chance of having lung cancer over the next five years for entry into this trial. This slide shows the results. With screening, more cancers can be detected. The graph shows the cumulative incidence of lung cancers according to screening or the control arm of no screening. The report suggested no significant impact on lung cancer mortality with the confidence intervals overlapping one. However, the trial was underpowered for its main outcome of lung cancer mortality. This was mainly because it was stopped prematurely when only just under 4,000 participants were recruited of the 16,000. Nonetheless, the UK LS showed us important new lessons. It showed that a single CT screen in this trial still benefited participants at long-term follow-up with a median follow-up of 7.2 years. This is different from most previous trials which had several rounds of screening, most often one year apart. We also know from the previous studies that new screen detected lung cancers are discovered at each round and this would occur up to 10 years in the COSMOS study. We know from the MILES study that the one year interval can be reduced to two years. And we also know from the Nelson study that the longer the interval and an interval greater than two years led to more lung cancers being detected at a later stage, therefore losing the advantage of screening. The interval also can be adapted according to a personal history of risk factors such as the presence of emphysema or history of chronic bronchitis as shown in the NLST trial. This slide summarizes all the major trials that have been published to date. The trials are shown in rows from DepiScan down to NLST, Dante, Miles European Studies, Danish Study, Italian Study, German Study, the Nelson, and now most recently the UK Study. You can see that the control arm varied from chest X-ray to observation, and the CT schedule varied. Most of them were one year apart, several rounds, and up to 10 years for some of the studies, and some were by like the mild study.
the numbers are shown in the next column here and you can see the larger trials with the NLST of the 25,000 in each arm and the Nelson study of 15,000 participants. The age of entry varied from about 50 to 55 to 75 or so and all of them required a history of smoking and you can see the intensity and duration of smoking in the next column. Some were restricted to different subsets and this was the only study using risk prediction. The interpretation of the nodules were generally following two types. The Nelson's type, which uses volumes, which we'll come to later on, and an LST, which worked on linear measurements. The follow-up duration is variable and continues to mature, and the results are shown here with a reduction in mortality shown in the NLST and Nelson studies as discussed. This final plot summarizes the results from all these trials, looking at the benefit and the magnitude of benefit in terms of lung cancer mortality. As you can see, the meta-analysis suggests there's a nearly 20% reduction in lung cancer mortality as a summary of all these different trials. Now we go back and look at the UKLS and its unique aspect of using a risk prediction score. This was the first randomized trial and it showed that this risk prediction to find the highest risk people may be optimized and used in the CT screening setting. Risk prediction screening is expected to find the highest proportion of screen detected lung cancers highest proportion of early stage lung cancers and require screening a smaller number of people to avoid one death. The number needs to screen. But because it requires additional information about risk factors, it may be difficult to implement, especially for people in the lower socioeconomic status who are more vulnerable to lung cancer anyway. In addition, there are no head-to-head -head trials comparing risk prediction versus the usual criteria, which is just based on age and smoking history, using criteria such as put forth by the United States Preventative Services Task Force. Now this slide looks at risk prediction models for predicting risk of lung cancer in people. The predictive factors are shown in the top row. And they are the usual ones we ask when we see patients with suspected lung cancer. Older people, sex, BMI, ethnicity, socioeconomic factors, smoking history, breathing tests, past imaging, and family and personal history of cancer and lung cancer, exposure to carcinogens such as asbestos as well as dust exposure, chronic lung disease, and some models also use genetic polymorphisms. Now these in rows are the different models that have been developed and now you can see a large number of them. I'm going to talk about the PLCOM 2012 risk model which we used in our current screening study which requires the knowledge of age, BMI, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, smoking, history, family history of lung cancer, personal history of cancer, and chronic lung disease because we recognize these to be risk factors. This is the trial we're currently doing with a number of collaborators, particularly Dr. Stephen Lamb and Dr. Martin Tamagi from Canada, a number of different sites across Australia, as well as collaborators in Hong Kong, UK, and in Spain. And this is a risk prediction study using the PLCO to identify those people with highest risk to undergo two rounds of CT screening. The results have been accepted for publication very soon and I hope you get to see these soon and I won't talk in detail about them until this is published. Nonetheless, I'd like to share with you some of the cases that we have seen in the study. This one is a 59 year old lady who had previously smoked had DCIS breast cancer adjuvant radiotherapy and came for her first baseline scan in 2019. 
The pictures are quite small, I don't know whether you can see, but there were two nodules detected, one here in the left lower lobe and another one here in the right lower lobe. Now here is the three month interval scan. Once a nodule is detected, we have either interval scans or proceed to biopsy or resection. If no nodules are detected, the participant goes on to a scan at two years. Again, we can see the tiny, uh, the tiny nodules here and here. Because there was no appreciable change at three months, this participant went on to a 12 month follow up scan. And I think you might agree with me that that one looks a tiny bit bigger and the right lower lobe one also looks a bit bigger. However, it is difficult to be sure unless we have comparative films. And part of our process is to ensure we compare scans serially so that we can look for growth, which is a marker of possible malignancy. So here, I think you can see from baseline to three months to 12 months, there is clear growth shown over 12 months, although it is harder to pick up with our eyes at the three month mark. So this participant went ahead to an FDG PET scan. There is moderate uptake in the right lower nodule and mild uptake in the left lower lobe nodule. They then went on to uh, bronchoscopy with endobronchial ultrasound guided trans bronchial needle aspiration, as you can see here, which diagnosed an adenocancer, adenocarcinoma, as expected early stage, and at resection with a lobectomy, it was pathological stage PT1BN0. Surprisingly, however, they found some granulomas in the lymph nodes when they looked at the pathology. And there's also metastatic carcinoid tumor in the subcrinal lymph node with no primary seen in the right lower lobe. We therefore wondered whether the other left lower lobe nodule, which had very mild uptake may be on the FDG, may be the primary for the carcinoid and went on to a dotatate scan which showed some uptake and again we used endobronchial ultrasound to biopsy the nodule which turned out to be a carcinoid and the participant has subsequently undergone a left lower lobectomy as well with the diagnosis of carcinoid. So that brings us to the next topic which is how to manage nodules effectively, either those found at screening or those who present clinically in routine practice from incidental findings or non-specific symptoms. CT scans are increasingly used, so nodules are increasingly commonly part of our practice. In our research clinical trial, we use the Brock model or PANCAN nodule risk calculator to manage the screen detected nodules. About 10% of participants had screen detected nodules and dependent on the nodule characteristics, they were assigned to five groups. Category one, normal, category two, low malignancy risk, three, moderate, four, high, and five, outwardly suspicious for lung cancer. And depending on the suspicion, they would have a short-term three-month CT scan or an annual CT scan or go directly to biopsy and or surgery. The nodule risk was calculated using an algorithm from the Brock model, as you can see here, which looks at age, gender, family history of lung cancer, emphysema, nodule type, location of the nodule, nodule count and speculation. And that would allow us to objectively categorize patients and offer them various treatments. So what other guidelines do we have to help us in practice? Well, there are multiple international high quality guidelines. Outside of our clinical trial, you can use the Fleischner guideline, which is limited to nodules detected incidentally. 
the ACCP or CHESS guidelines apply to both screen detected nodules and incidental nodules. The British Thoracic Society Thorax guideline again applies to screen and incidental nodules. And in the US, the Lung RADS version 1.1 system is designed specifically for screen detected nodules. We won't have time to go through them all, but they're easily available online and I'll just highlight a couple of examples. This is the Thorax BTS guideline for solid pulmonary nodules. If it's detected and it's of um, sufficient size, i.e. greater than eight millimeters or 300 millimeters volume, it would be assessed using the Brock model as in our study. And depending on the risk of malignancy, they would have a CT scan, which then use the Herder model to identify the risk of malignancy, less than 10%, 10 to 70%, greater than 70% risk of malignancy, and then either have surveillance, image guided biopsy, or direct intervention, depending on the risk of malignancy. So let's revise our nodule knowledge. What are these pulmonary nodules? Well, they're defined as rounded or irregular opacities, which can be well or poorly defined less than or equal to three centimeters in diameter and must be surrounded by a rated lung. The nodules can be in contact with the pleura, but should not include any one of pleural changes or lymph node abnormalities. Micronodules are designated those less than three millimeters. Solid nodules are the most common and they are of soft tissue density and they can obscure vessels as you can see here. Apart from solid nodules, we therefore have subsolid nodules or SSNs, of which there are two types, ground glass nodules and part solid nodules. Ground glass, when they're pure, are non-solid areas of increased lung attenuation that do not observe obscure normal structures. So you can see they are looking like cotton wool and you can see the vessels through. Them. Part solid nodules are the same with ground glass but also an extra component of a solid nodule within them. And as we mentioned, they are more commonly seen now, the prevalence of non-calcified lung nodules, because calcification indicates a benign cause, is up to 33% in the screening population, and incidentally is estimated to occur in 13% of people. One trick that I've learned is that you can use your PAX and the maximum intensity projection for your PAX system to look at the detection of small nodules with more sensitivity because this reconstruction brings out these nodules which can sometimes be hard to see on other projections. In terms of nodule management, the goal is to identify suspicious nodules that require further testing and to avoid unnecessary procedures for those people with benign nodules, therefore not subjecting them to risk. We have long known that predictors of likely malignancy include the size of the nodule and the growth rate, but we must remember that we are quite inaccurate in nodule measurements of smaller nodules in terms of the diameter, the volume and the growth rate, and we'll look at this to know how to overcome some of these issues. Firstly, even in screening studies, the size matters. The larger the nodule, the greater the risk of malignancy. As you can see here in the Nelson study, small, less than five millimeters, 0.4%, up to 15.2% if it's greater than 10 millimeters. That applies also for volume and also for volume doubling time. Consistently though, in all the different screening studies, as you can see here, the NLST, the Nelson, the Mayo Clinic trial, um, we know that those nodules smaller than five millimeters have a very low chance of malignancy, usually less than 1%, as you can see here and here, and the Mayo Clinic, 80% of cancers were greater than eight millimeters. So the recent guidelines for the threshold for calling a nodule suspicious or concerning is five millimeters or 80 millimeter cube for BTS and six millimeters or 100 millimeters for Fleischner for incidental nodules. 
We've mentioned how nodules look, and these looks matter. A solid nodule of five millimeters less is less than one percent. A subsolid nodule less than five millimeters has an even lower chance of lung cancer. And we know that if a ground glass nodule develops a solid component, the chance of malignancy is higher, and part solid nodules have to be very careful because they have a high chance of being a malignancy. And as we all know, in Asia, ground glass nodules can often be a slow-growing adenocarcinoma. So when we measure nodules and compare the size, we have to be careful. We have to be accurate. Accuracy is the difference between the mean value of the object measured and its true value. So we want to be as accurate as possible. We need to be precise. We need to make sure the different measurements don't change. It is very hard for small nodules when our eyes can't see very small changes. And the precision will depend on whether we're looking at diameter, the area of the nodule, or the volume of the nodule. And precision will vary depending on whether you use our eyes manually or whether they're semi-automated or automated ways using computers. So we should be aware of these technical and practical issues. Nodule diameter is not necessarily a reliable me method for assessing the whole nodule size. We often use one or 2D measurements on the axial image here, for instance, the longest and the shortest axis, for example. But the maximum nodule diameter may actually be not in the axial plane, as you can see here in the in the um, sagittal plane. We humans are also affected by variability between people and within ourselves. So for small non-calcified nodules, electronic calipers have poor intra and inter-reader agreement. And the best intra-reader repeatability with 5% error rates is about 1.32 millimeters. So that could be the difference between our different readings ourselves and between readers, the 95% limits are up to 1.7 millimeters. So small changes may not be real changes. Fortunately, we have some good guidance on how to measure. The Fleischmann Society suggests that we calculate the average nodule diameter between the long and short axis in whichever plane, whether it's axial, coronal, sagittal, that the nodule is maximum. For small nodules less than a centimeter, we can look at the average diameter. For large nodules, it's good to document both the short and long axis diameters in the same plane as well. These measurements can be harder in subsolid nodules, as you can see here. On the left are the lung windows of the same nodule, on the right hand side, the soft tissue windows. As you can see, obviously they're very different, and the measurements can be different. Uh, we also talked about how ground glass nodules can develop into part solid nodules and that occurs in about 5% and it may take several years so ground glass nodules need to be watched for longer than solid nodules and you can see the difficulty in knowing what to measure when its margin is not clear and also there's a solid component as well. So we already talked about how difficult the margin can be but the contrast between lung tissue and soft tissues is also important to realize where the measurement is taken from and to um, use the same type of reconstruction to measure and compare. The BTS suggests that two millimeters is the threshold which predicts malignancy when you're looking for growth and the Fleischmann Society also provides guidance for us. For these subsolid nodules. So what about measuring the volume of the nodule? Well we know from the Nelson screen trial that the volumes um, are the indeterminate 100 millimeters cubed or 300 for positive is better than using linear measurements of 5 or 10 because it has higher specificity and positive predicted values from that study. Why is this? This is probably because a volume of a nodule can increase by 26% and we can hardly see the change in the diameter because there's only an 8% change and when it's very small, that's difficult to see. However, a 25% diameter increase from here to here is nearly doubling of the volume, so that the volume may be a more sensitive indicator 
of change. But of course, with every measurement, even volumetry, there are issues to consider, technical and practical. Volumetry is subject to the parameters of the scan and the software you use. The automated systems that are used in research are not routine in practice, at least in Australia, and it can be time consuming if you have to draw the margin around a nodule and very challenging for those non-solid nodules with the ground glass components. So here I show you the same case that we looked at before manually to compare the human reading to the CAD, Computer Aided Diagnosis Reading. On the left lower lobe nodule, for example, the human thought it was 6.9 millimeters in average diameter and the computer thought the average diameter was 11 millimeters. The computer is able to give us a volume here, 3,026, where the human it cannot calculate that routinely unless they draw a margin. And also, because these are the factors that affect the risk of a nodule being cancer, we have different nodule malignancy probabilities calculated. 8.64% in this case with the computer-aided diagnosis, whereas the human thought it was 6.4%. So some differences but whether it changes management is a different issue. So this is just a table summarizing the different technical factors that affect volumetry measurement reliability and highlighted as the most important one, type of software package, the thickness of the sections and the reconstruction algorithm used for the imaging. So ideally you would use the same scan and the same technique in software every time, but since these scans are a few years apart, that can be challenging to use in the clinic. So I think we come back to clinical judgment and teaching. We know there are patient factors. We know there are nodule factors which indicate benign nodules, small size, calcification, fat density, peripheral lymph nodes, and we know the indicators of malignancy and its clinicians. It's using these knowledge, um, working together with the participant to work out the optimal management. In the last few minutes, I'd like to spend some time talking about an emerging technology for screening to help us find additional cases of early cancer, and that is by using blood biomarkers. We know that even with CT screening coming into place, it can only identify a small proportion of lung cancers. In the NLST example in the US, for example, you can see here, that if all NLST eligible people were screened, only a quarter of lung cancer would be detected. Most of them, two thirds of them, in other past smokers or never smokers, cannot be easily detected by screening. So there's been a lot of attention turned to blood tests for screening. And one of these is the Ontimum test, early CDT. It's a seven auto antibody panel, as you can see here. The early results suggested low sensitivity of 41%, but high specificity, and a large trial in Scotland, a large trial in Scotland, a randomized trial of 12,000 people for this test, where if you were positive in the test, you'd have CT screens for two years every six months, and if you didn't have a positive result or were in the control arm, no CTs would be provided. At the two-year follow-up mark, 127 cancers were detected in both arms, and in the early CDT, CDT arm, more cancers were detected, but they were um, of um, a earlier stage. There were fewer stage three and four lung cancers. There's no difference in mortality after two years, but that was not the outcome looked for. And the specificity was still high at 90%, but the sensitivity was lower at 32%. Another test available in the US is the Notify XL2 test. And this is a panel of blood proteins and it's intended to be used to classify intimate pulmonary nodules. The panoptic study of nearly 700 people with nodules between 6 and 30 millimeters using this test plus a clinical risk prediction showed that it was actually performing best in those people with a pre-test probability of cancer of less than 50%. In people with a lung cancer prevalence of 16%, so not a very high probability, the sensitivity was 97% for detection 
and a specificity of 44% and a negative predictive value of 98% so that it may be useful for low risk nodules. But new tests are coming as well. I show you two recent publications, a methylation based test and a DNA fragment based test, which I've referenced here for your reading. So in summary, tobacco control is so key to lung cancer control. Lung cancer screening can reduce lung cancer mortality. Blood biomarkers may be useful either after a CT scan to identify who needs investigation or before a CT scan to see who can and should go to CT screen. For us working in the lung field, it is important to know how best to manage nodules during screening or in clinical practice to detect early cancer and to avoid unnecessary tests. Come on, thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you at APSR.